Hello, um, my name is Dr. Venditti, and I'm going to be teaching the course on advanced topics in paper recycling, science and technology. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is just introduce myself. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. Uh, okay, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a faculty member in the Wood and Paper Science Department at NC State. I've been here for about 13 years. Um, I got my, re, re, uh, my background is a PhD in chemical engineering. I got that at Princeton University and then a bachelor's of science in pulp and paper here at North Carolina State University. And I also got a bachelor's of science in chemical engineering here at North Carolina State University. Uh, currently, my research areas are paper recycling and also the utilization of forest and agricultural materials for new applications. And I'm specifically interested in um, uh, polymeric materials and uh, how they can be used in advanced applications. Um, starch, hemicellulose, cellulose are some of the um, materials that I've studied. Uh, the classes that I've taught um, here at NC State, I teach the senior undergraduate students process control. Um, I also teach juniors in the pulp and paper program uh, unit operations for pulp and paper. Uh, that includes heat exchangers, um, fluid flow and pumps and pipes, um, mass transfer, uh, evaporation, and uh, humidity and uh, mass diffusion. Uh, and then I also teach this course, of course, paper recycling, and that's offered as a distance. Um, I'm also the director of our uh, departmental workshop for pulp and paper basics. Um, that's co-sponsored through TAPI, and so it can be, you can register for classes there. Um, through their website or go to our departmental website and um, register through that. Um, that's offered on campus and also in the mill. So um, we hold the courses three times a year here on campus. We um, have about 50% lecture and about 50% hands-on activities in our labs or our pilot plants. Um, and we've um, gotten really good reviews from students, um, people that um, are new to the industry and also uh, people that have been in the industry for 25, 30 years but wanted to learn, um, uh, you know, why things work the way they do. And um, so uh, that's a pretty successful program. And then I've also been involved in technical service projects for over 20 companies in the past 10 years, um, looking at things like uh, tracking adhesives through a recycle mill. Um, deposition problems, um, water clarification problems in a recycle mill. Um, I've looked at flotation efficiencies and um, uh, paper strength issues, um, additive issues in paper recycling. Uh, I kind of wanted to go through a list of some of the research projects I've had in paper recycling. Um, one of the uh, major efforts that I've put in was to look at the detection of adhesive contaminants and uh, tracking those adhesive contaminants through um, actual recycle mills. Um, it's not as easy as you might think. Um, there's uh, time dependent fluctuations that occur that can cause problems. You have to statistically sample your um, flow streams in the proper way. And then finally the testing mechanisms have variability in them and they're also somewhat complicated because um, for adhesive contaminants, not only do you have, to, um, you have to capture them, but you also have to characterize those contaminants as either being um, depositable materials or not depositable. Not depositable. <sighs> um, we've also looked at the changes in fibers upon recycling. Um, we've done this um, looking at paper being recycled and how the strength properties change. And we've also looked at um, single fibers how the stiffness changes, how it interacts with water, how that changes um, as you go through um, wetting and drying cycles, which represent um, the uh, recycling process. Uh, the other thing we've looked at is the effects of heating, um, wet fibers without water removal, and then um, and compared that to uh, removing water during heating. 
and how those two different processes um, contrast. Uh, early in my uh, career here at NC State, we, uh, myself and Homan Chang and others, um, looked a lot at the agglomeration de-inking process in the mid to late 90s. Um, and in that case, we were looking at toner particles and um, through a mixture of shear and um, at an addition of an agglomerating agent, we would take those toner particles that are plate-like and convert them to spheres. Uh, those large spheres are easy to screen or clean. And so that was, um, it's a technology, I think it's maybe used in one or two um, facilities, but um, it's not uh, a dominant process. Um, we've also looked at screening phenomena and pressure-sensitive adhesives. Pressure-sensitive adhesives are uh, soft, tacky materials that um, have um, elastic behavior. Um, they're able to uh, extrude and deform when um, external forces are placed upon them. And um, in screening, what happens is um, there's a pressure drop across the slots that are used to separate um, adhesives. And those pressure drops actually can extrude the adhesive. And we've looked at the relationship between pressure drop, particle size, particle formulation, and passage through the um, slot. And we've done that in the lab actually for, single, uh, for a single slot. And we take actually an individual adhesive particles, put it on the single slot, and apply different pressures and uh, make observations. Uh, we've got several manuscripts that kind of describe all those um, variables and how they impact the passage of the pressure sensitive adhesive. Um, we've also looked at deposition of adhesive contaminants. Um, important thing here that we found was that starch and other materials, um, cationic and anionic, all can absorb to the surface of the adhesive and make the deposition behavior different. Um, Dr. Hubie and Rojas and myself have written a review paper on this. Uh, alternate recycling processes. Some of the time we um, look at uh, new technologies that are um, pretty high risk and uh, we've looked at ultrasonic de-inking um, as other investigators have um, to um, separate the contaminants from the fiber surfaces and to break the um, contaminants. And then we've also looked at uh, supercritical carbon dioxide to extract wax from OCC. Um, supercritical carbon dioxide um, is like an organic solvent and um, wax is soluble in it and um, it's, a, it's a method to remove wax from um, waxed old corrugated containers. And then I just, I forgot to mention flotation de-inking surfactants. We have a project right now, um, myself and Dr. Rojas, um, involved in um, using natural surfactants rather than petroleum-based surfactants in de-inking operations. So there's a lot of different um, activities that I've been involved in and hopefully I'll um, I use these kind of activities as we go along our course and um, use examples. All right, now um, let's move on to the course outline. Um, we're going to first talk about the paper recycling um, United States industry and I'm going to do that today. Um, then we'll follow that up with um, a discussion of contaminants. And then um, we'll talk about the effect of recycling on fibers and paper. Uh, the next topic will be unit operations. Uh, we'll look at pulping, cleaning, screening, washing, flotation, dispersion, bleaching, uh, solid waste handling, and other um, operations that are important. Uh, we'll talk about image analysis, de-inking chemicals, and uh, surface, uh, surface phenomena that occur that are very sensitive to de-inking chemicals that are um, important in the paper recycling um, process. And then finally, we'll go to system design and we'll look at to see how you put these unit operations together and um, why uh, you make, why you use certain unit operations to make products with certain properties. Okay, a little bit of background on the course activities that we'll do. Um, you as a student should be very interested in this. Um, we'll be, uh, you'll be viewing uh, videos much like this um, throughout the semester. Um, the base lectures will be by me, um, but we will have some guest lectures from industry um, leaders. So we had a, a short course um, 
about a year or two ago, and um, we had experts in the different unit operations and different um, parts of the recycling industry, and uh, they came in and we got some nice lectures from there, a lot to learn from them too. Uh, the other thing we'll do is reading assignments. Um, the book is called Recycled Fiber and Deinking, and that's um, you need to purchase that for the course. And the reading assignments will mainly come out of there. There will be some other reading assignments um, from selected research papers. Some will be mine and others um, to give you a, a little bit more research flavor on what's going on in paper recycling. Um, homeworks, you'll have about six assignments. Uh, that will be um, the dates will, for that they'll be due will be in the syllabus. And then finally, there's a final project, and this takes up about the last third of the course where uh, you do a literature review and um, propose a research project. You don't have to do the research project. All you have to do is propose it. And so um, those things combined together uh, give us the complete course with um, reading, video, activities, and your final project. Okay, uh, there are two main course objectives. Um, one, the first one is a, to, to have you have a broad understanding of paper recycling science and technology. So you should know how it's done and you should know um, uh, what makes it work, the science behind it. And then the second thing is, is to develop an expertise in a selected research topic in paper recycling. And the, um, the student and myself will um, choose a topic together. And so it could be something of interest to you. And so you can, this allows you to go a little bit deeper in understanding a topic and also gives you some practice in getting a literature review done and also um, writing a proposal, which is important um, whether you're in research or any other part of life. Okay, so now I think we can get on to uh, the content of the course. Um, First, let me just kind of preface, you know, what are some of the hot topics in paper recycling, okay? And the first thing is, is that um, we're going deeper and deeper into the waste paper stream, okay? So we're recovering a larger percentage of what we consume um, when we talk about products, paper products. Now, what happens is, is that um, when recycling started um, in the 60s and 70s or, or even before that, um, we recycled the things that were very easy to recycle. And so the process was pretty simple. Now, as we've gone on and we've recovered all the easy material, the low-lying fruit, let's say, now what we're trying, when, when we have increases in recovered paper, it's of difficult to recycle material. It may be in remote places or there might be some other difficulty in it. But um, there are certainly increasing challenges now um, with respect to uh, trying to recycle more material. Okay, now at the same time that that's happening, uh, we're meeting, um, we're trying to meet paper specifications and they're increasing, they're getting more stringent. Um, a couple examples, we've got lots of optical character recognition devices now. Um, we scan in documents and we expect the computer to recognize words and um, uh, re Put, uh, put them in an electronic document. Um, we have scanning labels where we um, uh, scan like grocery store items and, and the price comes up automatically, optical um, barcodes and things like that. Uh, lottery tickets um, are another example where we need to get the print right. Um, so there's more stringent demands as we go more and more electronic and digital. And so we're faced, if we're going to use uh, recycled fiber, we've got to maintain uh, nice quality in our um, paper. Okay, um, emerging countries, um, Southeast Asia, Latin America, Africa, Middle East, are places in the world that um, are starting to demand more and more paper. And we're gonna talk a lot about that actually today in this lecture. And what that does is it puts a um, stress on existing um, industries in mature countries like the United States, Canada, and Western Europe. Okay, the final um, comment is that we uh, are going to recycle, but not all paper recycling is environmentally benign. 
In fact, um, in some cases, you could probably argue that paper recycling is um, a stress on the environment and that if you calculated all the energy um, used and the um, emissions and gases and solid waste, there you would probably be able to convince yourself that uh, um, we might be better off just combusting the paper and getting its energy value out. And there's been many studies um, that have shown that combustion is actually a better thing for our environment for certain grades in certain situations. So um, as we talk about recycling and um, analyze the process, we need to understand it's very important that um, we have environmentally benign um, processes. Okay, so now what I want to do is talk about the U.S. paper industry and we'll talk about um, recycled grades and the market, supply and demand, a little bit about the global situation and economics um, briefly. And uh, I'll start off by saying recovered paper, not waste paper. And what this comment is trying to get across is that uh, there is value in the fiber and we recover it because it's, valu it's valued. Okay? Waste paper con connotates um, that there's something that's of waste, that we're throwing it away, that it's of bad value. But as we know, um, recovered fiber actually has a lot of good usable fiber and um, in many cases it's uh, the right fiber for um, an application. So I like, I prefer the term recovered fiber. And uh, unfortunately, I'll catch myself saying waste paper, um, but uh, I try to avoid that. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the learning objectives for the course. Uh, first thing we're going to try to do is uh, understand the trends of paper recycling in the industry. Um, and then we're going to identify the major grades of recovered fiber and then we're going to identify the major types of contaminants in recovered fiber. So actually, this is basically the learning objectives for the, this lecture and the next lecture. Okay, so first, let's talk about um, some recycled fiber definitions. Now, you hear secondary fiber, and that's another um, term for um, what we typically consider recycled fibers and basically the definition says it's been previously used in a manufacturing process and um, probably used and then uh, reclaimed as a raw material for another process. Okay, now we have pre-consumer waste and post-consumer waste. Pre-consumer waste is any waste that's printed or unprinted that's generated in the fabrication or conversion of a finished paper. Okay before use by the consumer as a final end product. So what happens with pre-consumer waste is that um, something is made, let's say it's a magazine, and that magazine um, is um, printed in error, or it's an overrun, it's, they've printed too many and they can't sell them all. Um, if that material will go back to a recycle mill, that would be considered pre-consumer waste. Another example might be um, in the envelope converting process. Um, as you convert paper to envelopes, you have to cut and trim a lot of the paper material. And those trimmings and cuttings, um, they, if they are bailed up and sent to a paper recycle mill, which they almost always are, that would be considered a pre-consumer waste. Um, it can be printed or unprinted. Of course, the unprinted is more valuable because you don't have the ink there, and so you can avoid um, having to de-ink it if cleanliness is an issue. Now post-consumer waste is paper that is passed through the, the end usage um, process as a consumer product. So for instance, if you've read a magazine and then um, after you read that magazine you put it in your recycle bin at, at home and then that recycle bin uh, is taken and the paper is recycled, that would be called post-consumer waste. And in general the U.S. government encourages post-consumer waste recycling because they know it's difficult to, recy to re recycle it and uh, that this, there can be um, big gains in uh, post-consumer waste recycling and avoiding landfill disposition of the materials. Okay, now internal broke is also something you might hear about. Um, internal broke is <coughs> off-specification spec off paper that is repulped and used at the same site um, and it's not considered secondary fiber. So an example of re, um, internal broke might be 
uh, if um, a, sh a roll of paper is made on a paper machine, somebody tests that paper and they say, okay, it's not bright enough. And so they take that roll and they cut it and then they put it right back into a pulper right there on the machine. And then what will happen is that uh, it will be pulped and blended in with virgin pulp or, or whatever um, source of fibers they're using and then um, put right back into the paper. So in that case, the mill does not get credit for recycling. That's just um, their own mistake and they have to suffer with it. Um, this could be a, a couple other examples of internal broke might be um, when you cut the rolls and you have um, edge rolls that aren't um, sellable, they might be two, three inches um, wide, that would be considered internal broke. Um, I already mentioned off specification grade material and uh, there are other examples too. All right, now I want to go into a couple other definitions. Uh, recovery rate and utilization rate. These are um, fractions that describe how much um, waste paper is diverted from landfills and how much recycled fibers are contained in paper. So first, recovery rate. Um, that's an example of how much waste paper is diverted from landfills. And the recovery rate, or RR, is equal to 100% times this fraction, tons of waste paper collected, so we should call it tons of recovered paper, divided by how many tons of paper are consumed. So you can imagine in the United States we know how much paper we consume and we know how, many, how much paper is recovered and sent to recycling or, um, or actually it could be collected and burnt um, or it could be collected and exported. So all of these, the sum of all of these that is collected is, um, would be in the numerator. And so that would be the recovery rate. It tells you how much we divert from the landfill. The balance, um, if we, uh, the balance uh, is actually sent to landfill. Um, the utilization rate is the second thing we'll talk about. And the utilization rate is the fraction of recycled fibers contained in paper. So um, if you look at the definition here, UR is equal to 100%. And then we have tons of waste paper consumed at the mills, so it could be all the mills in the U.S., for instance, divided by the tons of paper that those same mills produced. So it tells us what's the fraction of uh, our paper product that was um, made from waste paper. Okay, now we can kind of, knowing our recovery rate and our utilization rate, we can start to talk about um, industry data. And this first graph right here shows the paper and paperboard recovery as a function of time. And let me try to use the pointer here, okay? So this year right here is 1993, and then this year right here is 2006, okay? And what you notice is that um, in 1993, um, there was about 36 million tons of recovered paper. That's the um, graphs. And then in 2006, the um, amount of recovered paper was actually uh, 53 million. So that's up here. So that would be 53 million. So we've increased our recovered paper in the United States from 35 million to 53 million um, in approximately 13 years. Now the blue graph, right, the blue um, line right here and the data points show the um, recovery rate, okay? And so the percent recovery rate has gone from 39% approximately in 1993 and it's steadily increased up to about 53% in 2006, okay? And, okay, so the recovery rate, of course, we know is a function of both um, how many tons of paper um, that are, are, are available for recycling in the U.S. And what we'll notice is that um, in 19 from 1993 to about year 2000, and I'm sure this, you can't see these numbers, but from here to here, from 1993 to about 2000, the supply of paper increased, but also our recycling rate increased quite a bit too. And so our recovery rates increased. Then, from about 2001 
to 2006, um, the U.S. paper industry has been suffering and not growing. And so what you'll see is that there's a um, pretty much a flat line in the supply of paper. We haven't been consuming as much either. And so basically when we recover, our recovery is still increased because of some external um, stresses on our um, external uh, and external uh, um, effects. Let's say I'm losing the word, but any anyway, there's been some reason factors, excuse me, factors um, like exporting has increased our recovered tons. And so basically um, the recovery has gone up and the um, production has gone or supply has remained stagnant. So our recovery rate has increased also from 2000 to 2006. Um, the data that I'm showing here is going to be uh, from the source AFNPA 2006 Recovered Paper Annual Statistics. Okay, now the utilization rate of recovered paper in the U.S. Um, this graph shows that as a function of time. And um, unfortunately, it's cut off at the bottom, but I'll have to tell you. This bar right here is at 1993. And then this bar right here is at 2006. And this data is on a yearly basis. And what you notice is that the um, percent recovered paper used in domestic mills, or the utilization rate, 1993, it was about 32%. And then it climbed up to about, uh, let's say, 36, 37, right about here. And then it's been stagnant or a little bit declining in the last five or six years. Okay, so right currently, um, we have about 37% utilization rate. And that's the average sheet of paper um, and uh, how much um, recovered paper is used to make it. Okay, now one of the nice things about the paper industry is that we have a real huge impact on um, the landfill situation. Um, landfills, the major material in landfills is paper, and um, paper, wood, and um, other organic material make up a, a majority of what's in a landfill. So the paper's got a really important um, part in determining how quickly we use up landfills. So if you look here, what this graph is showing is, it, again, it's from 1993 to 2006. And this curve right here is the um, paper that's been recovered in millions of tons. So again, we've had a considerable growth from around 38 million to about, it's hard to read here, uh, 53 million. So we've, we're recovering more paper. Um, and the paper that we're landfilling is this curve right here, so this small, this curve right here. And what you notice is that we have not increased the amount of paper um, going into the landfills per year um, since 1993. In fact, we're below the data um, from 1993. So all the recycling efforts have paid off. Um, we have um, diverted material to the landfills, and this is important to society because um, landfills are things that people don't want near them. Um, you hear about um, not in my backyard. And so what happens is uh, we have lots of area in the United States, but we don't have a lot of area to make landfills um, economically. Uh, for a landfill to be economic, we have to have it very close in proximity to population centers. And of course you have that um, conflict. Um, Close to population centers makes it cheap to um, truck the material, and you don't have to pay so, so much gas. But close to population areas uses up good space, and it's um, and I and and there's problems with people not wanting them close to their, where they live. So let's move on. Okay, here's another example of um, how pay, the paper industry is a dominant leader in um, recycling. And what we have here is a pie chart. And what you'll notice is that, and these are all packaging materials. So the packaging materials, you can talk about paper, glass, metal, plastics, and other. All these materials, um, the amount that um, they're recycled are right here, OK? And that's, so that's in millions of tons. So you see that we have paper, 22.9 million tons recycled per year. Glass is only 2.8 metal 2.2, plastic 1.3. It all totals up to about 30.5 million tons of packaging material recycled a year. And you can see that the packaging material, and this is where the pie chart comes in, packaging material that's paper or paperboard 
is almost is about 75 percent of all the packaging material recycled and the other um, items are much much smaller so you can see that uh, paper recycling and is a dominant player in packaging recovery okay now this um, table is uh, somewhat difficult to read but um, I will supply PowerPoint presentations so you'll be able to see it um, where you are but um, let's just kind of go through some of this data and just talk about what's happening here um, this column right here we've got the year and then we've got the consumption of recovered paper at paperboard um, paper and paperboard mills and what you see is that from 1993 to 2006 we've increased our consumption at domestic mills from 28 million tons per year to 34 million tons per year a dramatic um, very good increase um, consumption of recovered paper for other uses is increased from about 1.2 million uh, to about 2 million and um, this includes um, lots of different other products that use um, uh, recovered paper. They could be um, cat litter, for example, or they could be um, uh, material used, um, let's say, for pulp molded products or things like that. Okay, exports. Um, we had about 6.4 million in 1993, and that has grown considerably to 17 million in 2006 so it's almost tripled in 13 years and that's really the um, major um, factor that is influencing our recovered paper economy um, emerging countries and cultures are um, increasing their quality of life their um, their GDP and what happens is as they um, increase their quality of life their demand for paper increases significantly and when you start talking about China and India um, the populations there are immense in the billions and so um, even a small fraction of increased um, per capita consumption um, translates into huge volumes of paper required um, imports to the United States um, it's about very small um, from about 100,000 in 1993 tons per year to half a, half a million in 2006. It's a very small quantity. I'll show you a graph that demonstrates how small it is. Uh, total recovered paper, we talked about that, about 35 million in 93, 53 million in 2006. A nice increase there. And then the percent recovered paper used in the domestic mills, about 31, 32 million. We've already mentioned that in 1993. And then we have about... Uh, 37 million in 2006. So there's been an increase in the um, utilization rate. This is utilization rate. Okay, this graph right here shows the um, exports and imports to the U.S. Um, as a function of time from about 1992 to about 2006. This, um, the y-axis is millions of tons. And so what you see is that our exports have gone from about 7 million tons per year um, in 1992 and then they've increased and significantly increased in the last six or seven years and now we're at this point right here so in 2006 we're exporting about 17 million tons of recovered paper out of the United States and of course what happens is, is that the recovered paper prices increase as this demand increases and what happens is that the domestic recycling mills have to compete for this recovered paper with Asia. And um, for that reason, they have to pay higher recovered paper prices, and then their profits go down. And I'll show you a nice example of that in a little while. Um, this other curve right here, it's hard even to see, and I guess that demonstrates the point really well. This is imports, and we don't import a lot of um, fiber uh, recovered paper into the United States. It's almost been a flat line right here um, from 100,000 to half a million tons per year. What, what are the reasons? Well, um, we've got a lot of good virgin fiber and um, that virgin fiber can be used in our mills, so that's one good reason. And then the other reason is that um, typical flows of materials, um, a typical boat, for instance, is going to take a television set manufactured in um, China and the boat will be filled with these TV sets let's say come over to the US and then the, and the, um, then the, the boat 
will actually be filled with uh, recovered paper and sent back to Asia. So unfortunately for the U.S., we're importing high-valued goods and we're exporting low-valued goods. So that's not good for our trade balance. Now, um, things are uh, changing a little bit currently um, and because of the uh, dollar and the dollar's weakness, and so things can change. Okay, now let's go on and talk about major paper grades that are recovered. And I've broken them down into four groups, and these four groups are um, just useful um, for our discussions. Uh, they're not really um, a uh, um, concrete grouping. You'll see other people use different kinds of groupings, um, but I, I found that this is a nice way to think about things. So the first grouping is um, group is mixed papers, okay? And just like it says, um, mixed is the key term. It's low value because it's mixed. Um, recovered paper has lower value if you don't know what's going to be in it, if there's a lot of thing, different things mixed in there. So this could have um, mixtures of almost anything. Um, the next group is newspapers, um, old newspapers and special news and etc. And the common theme here in the newspaper is that there are mechanical pulps. Okay? Now mechanical pulps are, um, are produced when we take wood and we grind the wood. We use mechanical action to separate fibers. And um, in this process, um, we get very high yields because all we're doing is we're taking the wood and we're grinding it up and getting the individual fibers. Um, we're not um, doing any chemical treatments typically or harsh chemical treatments and for that reason um, there's a species a chemical in the fiber it's called lignin and um, the lignin is actually um, uh, it's a three-dimensional network polymer and um, it gives, um, it cements the fibers together in the tree, gives it its strength. Um, and what happens is for um, mechanical pulps, it's, it remains in the fiber. And so if you ever notice a newspaper and you see it yellow, the yellowing process is because um, the lignin actually is uh, interacting with the sunlight and um, chemical changes are occurring and that's what's causing the paper, the newspaper to go from a light gray to a yellow. Um, so we have one group with the mechanical pulp, we call it newspapers or old newsprint, ONP, um, and we lump that all together because we don't want to mix this fiber that can yellow with chemical pulps that are either strong um, in the case of unbleached or they're strong and they're um, bright in case of the bleached chemical pulps. So we've got newspapers. All right. The next category is called corrugated, and the corrugated, um, another way to describe this would be that it is um, craft chemically pulped, which makes a very strong fiber, craft meaning strong, and um, corrugated is also unbleached, so it's going to be brown, it's going to have that brown color. What happens during the chemical pulping process is that uh, the, um, much of the lignin is degraded. And um, during that chemical pulping, the uh, lignin um, gives uh, colored bodies that are brown. And that's why a box is brown. If you look at wood in, from a tree, it's, it's a creamy white. After you chemically pulp it, it becomes that brown box. And that's because some of the, a lot of the lignin is taken out when you do craft pulping, but um, a lot of it's degraded and remains in the fiber. And so for these unbleached craft pulping processes, um, we get these brown boxes. And so corrugated or unbleached craft um, can have old corrugated containers, container cuttings, craft paper and bags, and other um, materials that have unbleached craft pulp. Okay, then we go to the last group, and that's called pulp substitutes and high-grade de-inking. Okay? This group is a um, pre-consumer group. So these materials have not reached the consumer and have not been used by you or me. Um, pulp substitutes, what that means is that that material can be substituted for pulp um, as is, basically. So um, if you got a pulp substitute, let's say it's a clipping from an envelope converter. Um, those clippings would be clean, free from ink, free from glue um, to a significant portion if um, 
yeah, it was a pulp substitute. And basically, the term states that uh, it can be just substituted for regular pulp. So all you'd have to do with those clippings is um, uh, put them in a little pulper, swish them around with water and shear action, and the fibers would come would be liberated, and you could put that right on the paper machine. So that's why it's called pulp substitute. Now the other um, material in that category is called high-grade deinking. Okay, and high-grade deinking is also pre-consumer. Um, but it may have some ink, some printed material, maybe some adhesive, for instance. And so um, it's high grade because it's pre-consumer, but it needs to be de-inked. So the ink needs to be removed before it's used, if your application requires um, uh, high brightness, high cleanliness. Okay? And if you're buying high grade de-inking, you probably do have an application where you're making um, low ink content uh, recycled products. So pulp substitutes and high-grade de-inking, they're um, recycled at um, almost 100%, the recovery rate is, and um, high value, high cost. Okay, now I showed you four groups of uh, recovered paper, and that's a nice way to get our hands around the major categories. So we had the, uh, we had the uh, old corrugated containers that were the unbleached craft. We had the... Um, old newsprint, which was the mechanical fibers. We had the mixed, which is uh, mixed, could have anything in it. And then we had the pre-consumer, the high-grade de-inking and the um, pulp substitutes. But um, you can't really buy and sell recovered paper with those categories. Um, the buying and selling of uh, recovered paper is very complicated. And um, uh, you can have very subtle differences in a bale of recovered paper, and um, that can make an incredible difference in um, the uh, quality and processing in a recycle mill of that paper. Um, I'm just listing here a whole bunch of different uh, recovered paper grades, just to give you an example. So you've got mixed paper, you've got special news, you've got magazines. Mixed craft cuttings, new brown craft envelope cuttings, white blank news, many, many different types. And they all have slightly different properties. They'll give you different yields. They'll give you different cleanliness. They'll give you different strengths of your, recover of your recycled paper. Um, it's very important to understand exactly what the seller is trying to sell you when you're buying uh, recovered paper. Um, the Institute of... Uh, scrap materials, uh, and I don't think I have that uh, name right, but um, on the wet, on the internet there is um, a listing of the officially uh, recognized recovered paper grades. Um, and uh, if anyone's interested, they can contact me. I can point them to that website. Okay, now let's talk about the recovery of paper and paperboard um, for the different um, grades or types. Okay, and you'll recognize some of these things. Okay, so um, what I've done here is uh, let's talk about OCC. That's old corrugated container, and uh, that would be the type. And then the year is 1993, and I'll, I'll explain to you what all these columns are. Um, the recovery of the OCC, what's used at domestic mills is about 13.5 million tons in 1993. And in 2006, what's used at domestic mills is about 20 million tons. So you can see that there's a, about 6 or 7 million ton per year increase in the uh, usage at domestic mills. Okay, um, during that same time from 1993 to 2006, the amount that we export has increased from 2.3 million to 5.2 million. So it's actually doubled. And then the total recovered um, has increased from 15.9 to 25.2 million. So a 10 million ton per year increase in how much um, of the old corrugated container we've, we've um, uh, the increase in the recovered amount per year. And then finally, uh, the supply of cor old corrugated container, uh, 1993, was 27 million tons per year. 2006 is 33 million tons, so we've had an increase there. Now, let's look at the recovery rates. Um, in 1993, we were recovering about 60% of all of the corrugated container material that we produced and consumed in the U.S. And that has increased from that 60% up to around 76% in 2006. So let's think about this number for a little while. 
What that means is that three out of every four corrugated containers is recycled and one out of those four are actually go to a landfill or um, they're not recovered. So um, you can see that our recovery rate for OCC is very high and th some of the reasons why um, first of all, um, when you recycle OCC, um, it's a very valuable fiber. It's very strong. It goes through the recycling process very well, and it makes strong, bo strong recycled boxes. So that's one reason. The other reason is that there's um, really well-established systems that are in place to, uh, to um, recycle these boxes. For instance, grocery stores, department stores, um, and some offices. Uh, have bail um, have um, bins outside uh, their uh, office or thing and and employees are instructed to put all the boxes in so something like a grocery store has many 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 boxes and they all are recycled and it actually uh, makes a big impact on their bottom line they get uh, some value out of uh, um, collecting these boxes and then the waste pa the recovered paper um, uh, collectors and brokers they they take that paper and they pay a good price for it so um, it can make a, uh, a significant impact on the bottom line of a grocery store. Okay, then let's look at old newsprint. Um, what you see is the uh, consumption at domestic mills has gone up from 3.8 to 5.5 million. And I should mention that the growth of uh, mechanical pulps, old newsprint, is slowing. And the reason why is because we're not um, using newspapers the way we have been in the past. So this is a very stagnant to um, declining market portion of the paper industry in the US. Um, Canada where they manufacture a lot of newsprint is really suffering because of this. Um, people are just using alternatives. They're looking at the internet on, um, on a computer and getting their news that way. Um, so basically um, we're, we are consuming more ONP at the mills but uh, it's a smaller amount and the growth is not that large. Um, then we have the next column, um, what we're exporting. We're exporting about um, 1 million in 1990, and we've been exporting about 2.5 million tons um, in 2006. And basically that export is uh, export of uh, old newsprint from the U.S. back to Canada, where they have recycled mills where they de-ink it and then make newsprint, and then the newsprint is sent back into the U.S. So exports have increased. Um, but uh, again, this, um, the trends for this um, newsprint production and recycling are not good. Um, the other big um, usage that we have for um, newsprint is in pulp molded products. So um, you may be familiar with um, an egg carton or um, some other type of carton um, that's used to cushion um, maybe an electronic device in a um, corrugated container. All these molded products, typically they consume uh, newsprint. And um, in 1990 to 2006, that has um, basically doubled. So we have 1.5 million tons of newsprint in 2006 going into these pulp molded products. Okay, total recovery um, is about 5.5 million to 9.6. So it's doubled over uh, from 19, and actually this should be 1993. That's a typo. From 1993 to 2006. And then the total supply, 15.9. And then here you see that trend. Um, the actual supply of newsprint is going down. Okay, just telling you about that market. It's not doing well and won't, probably won't do well in the future. Um, and then uh, the recovery rate, 35% in 1993 and 72.3% in uh, 2006. So again, around 75% or three-quarters of all the newsprint is recycled. Um, that's a big deal. It's, um, uh, I mean, uh, they're, uh, why? Um, because old newspapers make good news, new newspapers, recycled newspapers. The other reason is that um, consumers can easily distinguish newspaper from other grades and put that in a recycle bin. So we have lots of, um, we've got um, suitable fibers and um, and a very recognizable product and uh, is recycled very well. Okay, um, another group of uh, types of recycled paper are the mixed. We've got 1993 and 2006 data. We've gone from 5.3 million tons per year to 12.7 million, so more than a double in our mixed paper, okay? And that's typically because of demand overseas for our mixed paper. Um, I don't have all the data for this, 
but um, about half of the mixed paper is actually recycled, the other half going to landfill. Um, pulp substitutes in 93 and 2006. Um, what you'll see is that there's, uh, we went, we've gone from 3.3 million tons per year to 2.4 million tons per year. So actually there's less pulp substitutes. That would indicate to me that the converting operations are more efficient and that the production of paper overall and paper products hasn't increased. Um, that's recovered at 100%. So we, um, this isn't a measured value, but this is just um, an expected value of 100% or close to 100%. And then we have high-grade deinking, 93 to 2006. Um, it's been flat, 3.7, 3.6 million tons per year. And of course, we, our expectation is that this is very valuable stuff, and it's recovered at 100% recovery rate. OK. So now we can kind of look at these um, different grades and um, see how much um, recovered paper is used in some of the paper products that we, ha um, that we make in the United States. So all these graphs, again, it's kind of small to see, 1993 to 2006 for all of them. And um, this graph right here shows how many million tons of uh, recovered paper was used in making container board. So what you see is in, from 1993, we have about 8 million tons using container board. And then it increases dramatically up to about uh, 2000, the year 2000. And then from 2000 on, at least at US domestic mills, um, we've been using, um, and th this number right here, 16.4 million, happens to be the um, amount that's used um, current in year 2006. <laughs> OK, newsprint, um, similar trends. We've gone from about 2.8 million tons of recovered paper used for newspaper recycling up to about um, 4 million tons. That was a max in about the year 2000. And then that's declined a little bit because we're just not reading and making as much newspaper. And right now, currently, we're about 3.5 million tons of recovered paper used to make um, recycled newsprint. Okay, let's go down here. This graph shows the um, recovered paper used in printing and writing grades. And what's happened here is that um, actually we've decreased our recycled um, material in our um, printing and writing grades. So in about 93 through 1998, and this was the heyday for recycled, let's say, copy paper, um, we were using um, around 2.3 million tons. And uh, we were using quite a bit of copy paper. And then um, since 2000, that um, amount has decreased down to about 1.5 million. Now, what's filled the gap there is virgin fiber. Virgin fiber has filled the gap there. OK, 7 million is the amount used um, in recycled paperboard. Now, um, recycled paperboard is typically it's a product that's um, made on multi-cylinder machines. And it's a very thick product. So um, perfect example are cereal boxes or shoe boxes. Okay. And so these shoe boxes and cereal boxes, what they want is a lot of bulk and stiffness. So what they do is they try to take very inexpensive fibers, coat them, and print on them. But um, the, the idea here is to spend as little as possible on the um, raw fiber material for these boxes because they're not seen. They're coated on the outside and the inside of the container doesn't really matter that much. So about 7 million tons per year of recovered paper is used to make um, recycled paperboard. Um, and that's kind of been flat or decreasing a little bit. Um, basically, it's been decreasing because the paper um, supply in the US or paper consumption has been stagnant or decreasing. OK, then um, we've got the recovered paper used in tissue. And this is a great application for um, recycled fibers. I think that this is one of the ones that uh, I really like. Um, it is a very good idea to use recycled fiber to make tissue that's going to be used once and then disposed of. It doesn't pay to um, use uh, expensive virgin fibers. So what you see is for tissue, at least, we've gone from 3.5 million up to about 4.2 million um, from 1993 to 2006. So nice growth there. All right, now let's talk about where some of these um, recycled grades, where do they go? We'll talk about old corrugated containers. Um, here are all the different applications that um, corrugated containers are used for. Um, container board is one, so back to boxes. And then um, 
Paperboard, so those are the shoe boxes and things like that. Uh, it's used there. That's about 3.9 million tons per year. Uh, the container board is about 15 million tons per year. Then some of it goes into tissue, some of the real bad stuff, the rough stuff that you might see in um, government or, or prisons or things like that. Um, exports, we're exporting about 5.2 million, and it totals up to be about 25 million tons of um, old corrugated containers. And what this pie graph here shows you is this yellow part is container board. So almost 60% of all the old corrugated containers go back into making um, new uh, recycled corrugated containers. Uh, the blue part of the pie is the recycled paper board, the shoe boxes, so a large go there. And then um, we export a significant amount, 20.7%. And our, our old corrugated containers are valued uh, overseas because we have um, very, uh, we have a high percentage of virgin fiber in our boxes. So um, these boxes make real strong um, recycled boxes. Um, if you ever kind of, um, you get a product from China and you have a very cheap box and um, you try to stick your finger through it, you can oftentimes just poke your finger right through the box. It's because they have such cheap um, fibers um, that they're using for boxes. They might be using um, hay or straw, um, uh, non-wood fibers, and they're very inexpensive and cheap and not high strength. So our boxes here are valued at a much higher level than the Asian boxes. Okay, where do old newspapers go? Um, newspapers uh, are used here for recycled paperboard, so that's shoe boxes. That's 1.2 million tons per year. Um, some of it is used in tissue, so we take newspaper and make some tissue out of it, low-grade tissue. Um, newspapers, 3.2 million tons per year, that's a significant amount. Printing and writing is small. And then we, of course, export 2.5 million of it, mainly to Canada. So our total is about 9.6 million tons. Um, so the different applications. So here in this pie graph, what you see, the blue part is um, made into new, to recycle newspaper here in the U.S. recycle mills. This um, purplish area right here is a net export, so that's going to Canada typically to be made into uh, recycled uh, newsprint and sent actually back to the U.S. Um, the yellow part is the recycled paperboard. These are percentages, of course. Tissue is a small percent. And then finally over here, all other um, and in this case, all other would include things like pulp mo molded products, so um, cushioning materials for uh, eggs, for instance, or for electronics in boxes. Okay, where do printing and writing papers go? Um, this is uh, tells us that uh, 2.7 million tons of the printing and writing material goes into um, recycled tissue, into made into recycled tissue. Um, 1.2 million goes into uh, printing and writing, uh, 1 million into other, uh, we export about 7.4 million, 7.3 million, and then the total is about 15.7 million. So if you look here, net exports is actually the dominant um, part of the pie here. And then recycled paperboard, did I mention that? Um, recycled paperboard takes about 20%. Um, I'm sorry, I missed that on this. Uh, on this list of data. And then uh, tissue is 17%, uh, printing and writing grade 7.6%, and then all others 6.4%. Okay, um, that's where uh, we use those types of materials. Now let's talk about what the recovered paper prices are. And this is just a quick snap, uh, quick picture of what the prices look like on May 24, 2007. And um, $105 per ton for a corrugated container. Um, old newsprint was at $85, so it's less expensive. Um, basically because the, uh, the newsprint that you make on a per pound basis is um, less expensive. So you can only pay less money for that fiber. Um, box board materials, $71 per ton. This is very cheap stuff. It could have, that's a mix, um, as a mixture of fibers. Old magazines, $19 per ton. Um, very low value um, for old magazines. Why? Because old magazines have a lot of clay and filler and coating material that can't be recycled and um, turned back into newsprint, um, turned back into uh, paper products. So you get a lot of sludge when you recycled old magazines. So that's why their value is low. Um, the fibers are typically 
um, small, um, fine fibers that aren't really have that much strength property to them. Mixed paper, low value because it's mixed. You don't know what you're getting, so your, your recycle mill has to be ready for almost anything there. Sorted office paper, $104. So sorted office paper is where you take um, some mixed paper, you um, invest some in taking out some of the real nasty stuff, and you, your value gets higher. So you might take away foil, adhesives, um, wax-coated materials, um, highly contaminated stuff. So this is your sorted office paper. And then White Ledger only has white, um, fully bleached um, craft pulp. It's high value. It's um, very nice. It's um, high brightness. Uh, you know, it's all white paper, no colored paper, so you don't have to bleach it as much. as It's got a very high value, $266 per ton. OK, so what you notice here is that the prices change for the different categories and that um, they can be uh, very dramatic, 19 to $266, very significant. Um, the other thing about recovered paper prices is our, they fluctuate with time. They actually track virgin pa um, paper product prices. And what we have here is um, sorted white ledger. Um, and that actually, in, OK, let's go. We've got data from 1970 to about 2005. And this curve right here is the uh, sorted white ledger. And what, sorted white ledger, of course, is the most expensive material. But you can imagine how difficult it is to um, plan a recycle mill um, because you may think that the price is going to be around here, which is about $100 per ton in 1992, let's say. And then if your mill can only take sorted white ledger and then the price goes up to $400 per ton, your profitability has decreased significantly by $300 per ton coming in. And so what happened was a lot of um, paper mills, recycle mills, were built in this era and then um, it was profitable. But then when the prices went up um, the, uh, of recovered paper, the, the mills were not as profitable, and they actually went out of business. Now, the selling price of the pulp that they were making also increased, but not as much as the uh, recovered paper prices increased. So that was a problem. So sorted white ledger, it's high brightness. It's been sorted. Um, it's nice stuff, and that's why it's so expensive. Now, some of the more cheaper uh, materials are ONP. That's the dash line. So here's the ONP, and you can see it fluctuates. But it's kind of been around uh, $75 for the last uh, 20, 30 years. And then you've got OCC, the old corrugated containers. And in general, it's a little bit more expensive than OCC, um, but it's also fluctuated. And it's around $75 to $100 for the last 30, 20, 30 years. Then um, you got mixed paper, that's the cheapest, and that's these X's down here. And you see that it, its value is you know, um, fluctuating around $50 for quite a while. And so that's um, inexpensive because you don't know what you're getting. You have to process it. Um, you've got to really process it based on the worst material that's coming in and thinking about getting rid of that. So take home points. The price fluctuates with time and also the value changes with respect to fiber type. Okay, now um, I just want to do a quick example of you know what goes into making profit or um, when you recycle pulp. And I'm just going to give you an example. And this is going to sh show you that um, currently it's very difficult to make a profit um, by producing DIP, de-inked pulp, okay? So um, just kind of give you an example and let you think about, well, what, what's the cost uh, to manufacture recycled fiber, OK? So let's just imagine we have a system. We're going to take MOW, mixed office waste, and we're going to de-ink it. And we're going to uh, bleach it also. So we're going to make de-inked bleached pulp. So this would be suitable for printing and writing grades. So for instance, we take mixed office waste, we clean out some of the contaminants, we bleach some of the uh, fibers that need it, and we get a bright, clean pulp. Um, to do this, we're going to have a system that has some flotation de-inking processes, washing to remove ink, oxidative bleaching, and all the complementary processes. And we'll talk about that this semester, um, well, all these operations that we need to clean that pulp. We're going to produce 200 OD tons per day, so OD, TPD, oven dry tons per day. And our yield we're expecting is 67%. So, to produce the 200 oven dry tons per day, we're going to have to bring in a lot more recovered paper because 33% of our solids that we bring into our system are lost as sludge. Um, the total capital cost to install this type of process 
operation is about $42 million. Okay, so that would be the capital cost to build a plant recycle mill. And um, one of the assumptions is that we're going to take um, about $6 million per year depreciation for seven years. Um, so uh, th that's going to help us in our, our um, calculating our tax um, penalty for this operation. And then the mixed office waste that we're going to buy and use in this operation, um, the cost is going to be about $220 per ton delivered to our doorstep. So there are some of the assumptions for our system. And let's look at how the economics look like right now. The first thing we can do is talk about some of the variable costs. These are costs that are incurred when we produce our product. Okay, So um, what we'll look at is um, this column right here is the description of what's the variable cost. So we have fiber and chemicals. We have um, electricity, steam, uh, wastewater treatment, waste disposal. So the first one is fiber. And for every, and, and what we're going to do is um, the quantity that we're going to have is 1.5 tons of material. It's going to cost $220 a ton. And that is going to make a contribution in dollars per ton to our final product of $330. So for every ton of recycled paper we make, we need to buy 1.5 tons of recovered paper at $220. So that means that for every ton of recycled paper we make, we have $330 in fiber costs. Okay? All right, so that's a huge number, $330 per ton. And then if you look at some of the other items, sodium hydroxide is only $10 per ton. Peroxide, $14 per ton. Sodium silicate, $11 per ton. Flotation aid, $3 per ton. Sludge dewater polymer, $1.4 per ton. Clarifier um, chemicals, around $1 per ton. Electricity, $14 per ton. $1.5 per ton for steam. Uh, let's see, waste water treatment, uh, almost a dollar per ton. Waste disposal, that would be the solid sludge that we um, produce when we're removing contaminants, $35 per ton. That, that's actually the second largest variable cost per ton of our material. Process water, $2 per ton. So our total variable product cost is about $424 per ton, and you can't see that on that slide. I apologize for that. So the total um, variable cost is $425 per ton. And uh, of that, almost three quarters comes from the fiber. And that's a take home point. The recovered paper that you purchase is the major variable cost in producing recycled paper. Okay, now we move on and we can talk about some of the fixed costs. Um, first one is maintenance. And we're just assuming that per year we're going to spend $4 million to maintain our plant to repair things and keep things um, lubricated and um, functional. And so that $4 million equates to about $57 per ton in cost if we're making 200 tons per day. Labor um, to run the mill, about $29 per ton. Operating materials, uh, $24 per ton. This would include things like um, oils, greases, cleaners, um, any kind of operating materials that don't go into the product but are, need, are required for um, running the operation. Uh, depreciation is a true cost that we can talk about. So we'll depreciate over seven years straight line. Um, so each year we get $6 million of depreciation or, or decrease in value of our mill. And that translates to about $86 per ton. Business overhead, um, carrying all the um, uh, things that we have to do, uh, uh, pay for for business, we get about $16 per ton. So that would include billing, um, accounting, uh, tax preparations, things like that. And so if you look at all the fixed costs, it's about $211 per ton. So that's also significant. So now let's take a look. So our total cost now is our variable cost plus our fixed cost. So our variable cost was around $400. Our fixed cost is around $200. So those two add up to about $636 per ton of material produced. The total cost per year, if we take this, this quantity, multiply it by 200 tons per day, and then the amount of days per year, we have to pay 44, about $44 million per year to produce that pulp that we're talking about. The selling price of the ton of de-inked pulp, um, we're just going to use a 
estimate, $600 per ton. And if you think about it, okay, our, uh, to produce a ton of pulp was $636 per ton. So actually, we're going to lose money for every ton that we sell. Um, the income actually is going to be $42 million. That's the 600 times how much we sell. The profit before taxes is negative $2 million. Taxes is 25%. So we get actually a discount here of um, $400,000. And then the profit after taxes is a negative $2 million. So the return on investment is um, basically we break even or we lose money. Okay, so um, this is just an example of the stress, the, str the, the pressure that our domestic paper industry is facing right now. It is not economical to um, spend a lot of money to um, upgrade fibers um, in that sense. So um, basically, you can see that uh, domestic paper mills don't want to pay a lot for their fiber costs, and they're competing with overseas um, uh, entities that want to buy the fiber at high value. And so uh, right now, um, for de-ink pulp at least, um, it's not very profitable. For things like newsprint, and uh, for uh, OCC, lower valued materials that you don't have to spend as much money to clean up, have lower variable costs and actually lower fixed costs too. Um, they're uh, much better than this. So um, you will have some uh, paper mills that are producing de-inked pulp, but the um, climate is very bad for that right now. Okay, now let's just kind of get a little bit of a global perspective on what's happening with the paper industry and how it impacts the um, domestic, U.S. domestic recycled um, uh, market. Okay, so here we have plotted uh, metric tons per year of, uh, this is the uh, global paper and board demand. Okay, so what we have plotted here is from 1989, so this is 1989, all the way up to here, which is 2005. And basically, it's kind of hard to see but um, we've got different categories. The red is printing and writing. This um, pink is uh, actually news. The blue is tissue. The green is container board. And then the white lines, and it's very difficult to see, but the white line, it ends right here, is other paper and board. Okay, so in 1989, we, um, and let me just look very carefully here. In 1989, we were, um, the demand was about 225 million tons, and that's a metric ton, um, per year. And then that 225 million has grown to about 360 million tons per year. Okay, So we had a, a dramatic increase from 225 up to right here, which is about 360 million tons. So the global demand for paper is increasing and it's increasing very rapidly okay and you can see that um, container board is growing printing and writing is growing news is stagnant or declining tissue is a small part of it but is growing a little bit and so um, we've got an increased demand in paper okay and so think about it um, from 225 to 360 um, we've got uh, about 140 million more tons per year of paper that's demanded. It's an overall positive growth. Okay, so now how does that affect us and, and where does that come from? Well, what we're plotting here is on the y-axis, it's the um, paper and board consumption in kilogram per capita. So kilogram per person per year. And um, basically you've got some economies that have very low um, uh, uh, consumption per capita and then you have other economies right here that have very high um, per capita consumption and what we have here on the x-axis is the um, gross domestic product um, and basically it's it's per capita per person in US dollars and um, what you see here is um, that uh, for um, economies where we're um, producing a lot of value in our products, like $40,000 per person, what happens is the consumption of paper is very, very high. And then for poorer countries that don't produce as much value in their products, their consumption is very low. So China and East Asia are in this 
category right here. And with the billions of people, what's going to happen is their quality of life is going to go up, and they're going to go up this curve. And what that means is, is that the demand for the paper is going to increase. Eventually, it levels off out here, where you can just use so much paper per person. But this explains to you why we expect a lot of growth as these emerging economies, Latin America, Asia, um, even uh, East Europe, um, these, these growth areas are going to cause more um, demand on paper. So the, the fact is, is that with more um, demand on paper, we're going to have higher prices of our recovered paper because people are going to want the fiber to make more paper. All right, now this is the gross domestic product um, for different areas in the, in the world, and um, it's actually the growth in percent per year. And so what you can see here for green, this curve right here, this is from 1989 to 2005. This green line right here is China. And China is growing, its GDP is growing at 10%. So it's got the highest growth rate of any. So it shows you that there's dynamic growth in the China region. Um, black is Eastern Europe, which is a, is, has a smaller population, but it also is growing at about a clip of about 5 to 7% per year. So here are two areas, East Asia and Eastern Europe that are um, definitely growing. Um, all the other areas are at around the 2% growth level. So what we've got here is um, the blue is Brazil, um, red is USA, um, gold is Japan, and um, what you see is that they, they're at about 2% growth, so much slower growth. So the demands for paper are originating from East Asia, Eastern Europe, places that have high growth in their GDP. Um, just to kind of let you know, um, things are changing in the paper industry. And this shows market pulp production. And it, what, what it's describing is that there's um, fiber um, supplies moving to the southern hemisphere. So places like Brazil and Indonesia are growing, um, are increasing their um, production of, um, this is virgin market pulp. And they're trying to meet the new demands that this, um, that we showed before, the demand increasing. Now, what about recovered paper? Um, basically, the growth in China and Europe um, is, is um, increasing. So what we have here is we've got um, from 1989 to 2005, um, green is Western Europe, uh, pink is North America right here, and then the red on the top is Asia. And what you can see is, in, um, is that for Asia, there's quite a bit of growth in their use of recovered paper. In Western Europe, there's also some growth. And they're basically because Western Europe has um, stronger governmental guidelines that are increasing to, um, because landfill issues are even more stressful in Western Europe. So they're growing their use of recovered paper. So they're making more recovered paper. But the U.S. is um, staying about the same. It's been staying about the same for, from 1997 to 2005. So the demand for recovered paper is growing in Asia, it's growing in Western Europe, but not in the U.S. Um, and this just shows that this plot right here is a recovered paper balance in the USA. The green line is how much um, recovered paper is being used in the U.S. And you see that we've gone from 17 million tons per year in 1989 up to about 31, 32 million in uh, 2005. So we had some growth up to about 2000, year 2000, and then we're flat. And then if you contrast that, how much we're exporting is this blue line. And wh what you see is we were about flat up until about 1997, and then we started to export more material. So we went from about 7 million tons per year exporting up to about 15 million tons. So our exports are growing, and that's causing recovered paper prices to increase in the U.S. That's making it hard for U.S. recyclers to make a profit. And really, if you take a look at that increase in exports, this red line right here is exported to Asia. And what you'll notice is that they track nicely. So basically, these increases in exports are because of the increase in exports to Asia. So Asia is really, really, really affecting the way that U.S. Um, recycled paper market is occurring, is, is behaving. Okay, so that's what I have for you today, and I'm just going to summarize it on this last slide. Um, first thing that I would like you to remember is that the recovery rate is increasing in the United States. And um, one of the reasons is because domestic production has decreased 
um, significantly in the last five or six years. Um, we uh, had a maximum over 100 million tons that we were producing, and that's gone down to about 90 million tons recently. And we were still trying to recover more material because the price of recovered paper is going up. So um, we're recovering more. We're not producing or consuming as much, so our recovery rate is going up. Um, with respect to the different grades of recovered paper, OCC, Old Corrugated Container, ONP, Old Newsprint, are recovered at very high rates, around 75%. Reason why is because the fibers that are contained in these um, groups are of high value and they, um, they make um, really good recycled products. And there's also uh, methods um, and systems set up to recover these. Um, third thing, the price depends on the quality of the fiber. How much has been invested in, in getting the fiber to you? So if it's been sorted by hand, it's going to be more expensive. If it's mixed and it's... Um, Low quality fibers, it's going to be cheaper. And then you also have fluctuations, and those are time fluctuations, and that depends a lot on how the economy is going and how other things uh, dictate the price of the paper. Um, next one. Currently, it's difficult to make a profit in the U.S. making recycled de-inked pulp. Um, we looked at an example where our return on investment was basically zero. And um, you can see that there's a lot of stress on domestic paper recyclers to make um, make a profit and be um, economically viable. Um, it's a little bit better for newsprint and uh, OCC, so those mills are doing much better. In fact, there's been an announcement recently about uh, um, new OCC mill starting up in Alabama, I believe. Um, and then the world market strongly influenced the domestic paper recycling market, and um, East Asia is a major player. Um, the uh, potential paper demand there is incredible. Um, China is increasing their uh, production, but they're also going to need recycled uh, fiber, and it's, their boats are available. Um, they'd go back to China empty if they didn't have recovered paper in them, so it's, uh, there is a way to get it there, and they um, do value our fiber. So that Asian demand is going to influence the U.S. domestic paper recycling economy quite a bit. And um, that's going to conclude my talk on the paper recycling markets. Um, thank you for your attention, and that will be it.